I'm uh, Dave Robertson. I'm an outdoor writer based in Calgary, and I uh, have the opportunity to uh, to host these evenings. I think I'm riding on the coattails of some pretty special people, as always. So uh, I just want to say a quick hello to uh, to Zoe Ryan, uh, Avalanche forecaster at uh, Sunshine Village, Marcus Fairnow, uh, infamous uh, ski bum, and our host for this evening, Kevin Hergitas. How'd I do tonight, Kevin? Yeah, not, not bad. Okay. All right. <laughs> anymore. Uh, who will uh, be hosting this evening. Um, thanks for joining us for uh, this evening's uh, March uh, snowpack uh, update, uh, which is, of course, sponsored by uh, our friends at, uh, at uh, Ski Up Hill. The yeah, so things have changed. <laughs> thanks, Michael. Things have changed a lot in the last month. And uh, where everyone's been skiing and what's been good has changed a lot. So as always, we are stoked to have our uh, two local experts here to help us figure out what has happened and what's going to be happening going forward. Springtime in the Rockies is always the best time of year. So uh, let's set it up right and then I'll go out and have some fun. So tonight we're going to do a little different. We're going to start with Marcus, talk about uh, where people have been skiing and what's been good and, and some local beta. And then we're going to go to Zoe for, the, for what we always do, talk about snowpack, talk about weather, what has happened, uh, what is happening and where that's going. And then we'll bark or bounce back to Marcus to yeah, talk about uh, some spring objectives, what usually gets done in the, no problem Dave, what usually gets done in, in the spring and end the night talking to Joelle at the shop there to talk a little bit about gear and some spring concerns that way. So yeah, should be a fun night. But Marcus, let's let's start um, just by saying, you know, so far early season, 93 North was kind of the place it always is because you start up high. And then as the season progressed, we didn't have the, the super weak basal facets midwinter that we often have. And so 93 South was was actually better than usual because the lower elevation wasn't horrible. And 93 South saw so much traffic. Uh, yeah. And then the last little while, you've been going some different places. What have you been up to? <laughs> yeah, so I was supposed to be on a very long traverse right now. Um, that got canceled thanks to a little bit of COVID and some other things. But uh, so I started trying to finish my next book, um, which is actually the first book I had. Um, so that's going to cover Banff to Castle Junction. So I'm just going to share my screen. A couple of places. I've been skiing so uh, for me it's all been about uh, lately the massive range um, which gets skied but it's kind of a, a little bit maybe of a local secret area uh, the, the main one being a massive mountain so on google earth they mislabel this one as massive it's actually the smallest one um, and most recently, I've skied this path off the unnamed, which is really great. It's um, about 700 vertical, uh, open face avalanche path right off the highway. That's the so, one you see from the highway that always looks so desirable. Yeah. And uh, so this is Banff here. And yeah, when you're driving around, you can see the, the one that you see better is this little triangle that looks really good. Right. But what's had it actually hidden behind it, and you can't quite see it very good from the highway because of this angle uh, is this bigger face. It's actually quite massive and it goes all the way down well into the forest. It looks really forested, but you can ski, you can get turns a long way. Wow. That was really quite good. Um, and then I've skied this line twice because I went for pictures of this area and the clouds rolled in. So then I had to go back and ski it again, but both times was phenomenal skiing, uh, 600 meter line. This is off Pilot Mountain, if people are unfamiliar with that. And um, if you're unfamiliar with the area, right down here, you can sort of see the parking lot for Red Earth Creek. So it's pretty easy. You have to bush bash a bit, and then you get up to here. And there's actually a ton of skiing up here for people that aren't familiar with it. There's shoots all off the massive. There's about half a dozen uh, four to 600 meter avalanche paths off Pilot. There's this little pass area. And then even on the backside here, it's really bad resolution in Google Earth right here, but there's a whole bunch of these really nice paths leading into a clean drainage. And then up here is some shorter Alpine stuff, but not, not much that's noteworthy. Uh, so that's where I've been. 
Um, but there's more interesting places that people can ski in. <laughs> uh, for example, whoa, what's Google Earth doing? So some of the Ski Uphill crew just did this guy here, uh, the dolphin face on Mount Temple. So for people that are familiar with Amer Kular, that's right over here, pretty easy to see. Um, and then you got Cobra Kular, which has sort of become more popular in the last five or 10 years. Uh, but, oh, is my screen frozen, everyone? Yeah, you know, it just kind of goes, uh, it takes a while to catch up, so just move slow. But uh, okay. I see it so, now, I see the yeah. dolphin face looks great. Amers right here, no. Cobra, and dolphin climbing line that gets skied. And then right here, this wasn't skied recently, I don't think, but this is uh, what's called the Sphinx face, which is a rock climb that people ski more often to bail off the rock climb than actually to go skiing. Uh, and then today, or maybe yesterday, I'm not really sure, uh pope summit kular got skied uh so probably almost certainly second descent of this one from the top so a lot of people ski is it not working oh so the the bottom part of this cooler gets skied quite frequently but right here it's really kind of hard to tell but there's a giant ice waterfall or a serac tower depending on when you get there. You have to climb up it and then you go up to the summit. Um, so that one's pretty wild. Uh, who, who was, that? Was, that, was, that that? Joel? was that Joel that got that done? No, so Mark and um, what's what's her name? Brett. Brett. Oh, no or way, Brett, good uh, for them, yeah. Yeah, uh, they went up, uh, yeah, and then went up and did it. Taylor, uh, my buddy Taylor, he went up to the Serac and turned around. <laughs> but I think that's what he did, from judging from his pictures. Uh, for people unfamiliar with that area, uh, this is Lake O'Hara Road. Uh, so this is Kicking Horse Pass. And yeah, it's up. Uh, this is more of the classic area people ski, the Pope's uh, Call right here. And then I don't know if we talked about it last time but because I don't remember if it was after our last talk or before, but Cascade East Face is probably the other really noteworthy uh, one that got done. Um, that was Wexler and crew. Uh, so they went up. So if people aren't familiar, that's Cascade. Everyone knows that. It's the one that had the earthquake. Oh, it's not there yet. It's coming. It's coming. I got, I got tech support in the other room. So anyone that's familiar with Cascade, if you look at the main face, the south face, that's called the postcard line. That was skied in 76, I believe, or 73. I could be mixing up the dates. But they climbed up the south face and they skied down the east face. So those that drive from Canmore to Banff, you've probably seen the east face lots of times and thought, well, that's not skiable. And it isn't without a rope, I guess, uh, as they found out, because I think they said it was four or five repels. I don't quite remember, but quite a few repels and some pretty big terrain. So yeah, that's just a quick snapshot of what I've done and some pretty notable descents in the valley. Yeah, it's not often you see uh, three first descents done in a month midwinter in the Rockies. So that is yeah. pretty noteworthy. Um, yeah, and those are all rad descents, and I think people can probably go online and read about those a bit. What about uh, your average Joe? I mean, that's the that's like six <laughs> people or nine people. What do you think most people have been skiing? I was on 93 North today. There was a fair number of people on uh, Crystal Ridge, uh, but yeah. things weren't generally busy on 93 North today. No, but I know the weekends have been pretty busy, um, probably because the 93 South has sort of in the first warming there, I heard it started getting kind of iffy down low. I mean, down in the 93 South, you could be skiing as low as I believe 1200 meters in some spots. So mm -hmm. the minute it gets warm down there, it's, it's pretty crappy to try to get to the good stuff. 
obviously people will, will ski there in the 93 cell for some time, but I think that lower uh, elevation is turning people off. And I have heard of more people uh, skiing up in the 93 North. I know like uh, on the weekend, there was probably about 40 people skiing at Crowfoot Glades. Oh yeah. Um, I think there is still some AST one <laughs> courses going on. So uh, they're doing it there. And yeah, I mean, I was up on, uh, um, I don't know if my thing's updating, but I was up here in the uh, Helen shoulder area and there's almost no tracks when we were there and the scheme was quite good. Uh, but then I heard uh, it got busy again. So I think there's been this movement and we're going to continue seeing that movement um, from the lower elevation places to these kind of higher starting points uh, yeah. just to not deal with all that kind of wet or snow. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, then maybe what we should do is uh, talk to Zoe a little bit about snow and then bounce back to see yeah, what we will be doing going forward, Marcus. Does that sound good? That sounds great. All right, Zoe, thanks for coming out again. Um, yeah, so it's been a month since we talked last. Uh, what's been going on weather-wise, and then what does that mean for the snowpack so far? What, what's been happening? Yeah, uh, so I think the last time we talked, it was pretty cold out there. I remember, you know, minus 30, minus 35 temperatures. A couple of brave folks were out there getting after it but for the most part it was really cold um i'll just bring up my screen here bear with me for a minute oh yeah that's right i'm glad that the the cold weather has ended at least because that, that was that was i mean not not that long lived luckily and uh yeah made made the surface fasted out of it made the skiing okay but uh i was surprised how minimally it rotted the snowpack like you know, I thought the cold snap was going to come. We we're going to go right back to that faceted snowpack that was, you know, the classic Rockies punchy, but that didn't really happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm having a bit of trouble sharing my screen here, but we'll just talk about it for a little bit here. Um, it got pretty cold, but fortunately, we had a relatively deep snowpack for, for the Rockies standard, at least. We're looking at, like, two meters in some places, maybe a meter 50 in shallower areas. So um, it really didn't have as much of an effect as it could have. But um, certainly we did see pretty extensive faceting in that time. So yeah, following that cold snap, we had a relatively large storm come in. Um, we saw roughly 50 centimeters of new snow in Banff National Park, um, depending on where you were. And that had a, we had a big natural avalanche cycle out of that, um, getting up to size three avalanches, all within the new snow, notably, but, um, lots of big avalanches at that time and an increased hazard. Um, following that, we had a couple of smaller storms. And then really notably, we had that warm up. Um, an Avalanche Canada put out the special pub public avalanche warning um, for, I think it was a weekend ago now, maybe a week ago. Yep. And in that time, um, yeah, we were seeing persistent slab avalanches. Uh, those were failing on um, the facets from that cold temperature and from that cold period, mostly. Um, and we saw an increase in avalanche hazard during that time. Right. I mean, you mentioned already, but I, I, I mean, it was interesting that the cold snap came later in the year. So we did have a deeper snowpack on the ground. So we didn't get that base fastening the way we sometimes do or not as bad. But those facet layers just ended up being surface facets that were then buried by 50 centimeters of snow or, or more. And, and so there's still persistence, you know, persistent weaknesses, but, but not at the bottom. And, and like you said, it, it is interesting that, you know, pretty typically in the Rockies, it seems like when we go through a big avalanche cycle like that, there's more activity that goes to ground. But uh, the, that really wasn't happening very often, was it? Yeah, we really haven't seen that yet this year, um, which we've been fortunate for. Um, although that could start to change as we transition into spring and we see uh, more significant warm-ups and uh, large cornice failures, so large loads that could trigger these deeper layers. Yeah, th I think that was sort of on our list of, of things you wanted to talk about today was, was that cornices are, uh, are a concern right now and going forward. Uh, why is that? They, have they just grown a lot recently or is this a matter of them rotting or temperature change? What, what's on your mind there? 
Yeah, so um, traveling around, there's some pretty large cornices um, around the place. And as we start to see warm temperatures, we'll probably start to see those cornices fail. Um, and those large cornices could create a large load on the snowpack and potentially trigger those deeper layers. Yeah, I think last time, uh, just a uh, memory when we were talking about, we were looking ahead to the cold snap a month ago. And, uh, and we, we had said that maybe some fasting would happen behind the, the cornices and sort of weaken them. And then that process would deteriorate them. And that's yeah, that's probably, a really good point for sure. Yeah, I probably did. And then, then they grew. I don't know, I was out today and it sure looked wind scoured on every ridge top. Like there must have been a lot of wind recently and uh, growing the cornice. And then like right now, there must be almost 20 degree uh, temperature swing today, I think. Totally, yeah. So when we get into springtime, the, the sun is higher in the sky and we start to get what we call a diurnal temperature fluctuation. So at the night, in the night, it cools down significantly. Um, people were reporting like minus 20 starts from the car this weekend. And then during the day, it can warm up to, you know, 10, 15 degrees. So it's a really rapid and, and noticeable change in the temperature. Yeah. Uh, you guys been getting any big results at the ski hill? So today we had uh, an avalanche awareness day and we put on a bit of a show on North Cornice, which is an area just down from Delirium Dive. And we hit a large cornice in the Silver City area. Um, so a really large explosive triggered a large cornice and that actually triggered a size two and a half persistent slab on the slope below. To ground? Um, not to ground. The crown was like roughly a meter deep scrub to ground in like really shallow areas, but for the most part, um, we're suspecting it failed on that um, February layer. Okay. <clears throat> but that's a really good indication of what we could start to see um, when these cornices do fail in the springtime is that they still are able to trigger those deeper layers in the snowpack. Hmm. Yeah, uh, two weeks ago now, I was up on down in 93 South in the Serac area, Serac Peak area, just in the burn, but a huge cornice fall uh, took out, you know, dead standing trees and, and uh, was almost uh, definitely a size two and a half avalanche by the end of it. But uh, yeah, cornices have me a little scared right now too. <laughs> um, how, how's coverage right now in sunshine? Like, you know, I haven't been up there at all, but uh, it's a good indicator for the rest of the park. Like, are we sort of looking pretty normal for mid-March or is this a skinny year or a fat year? You know, I wanted to show you guys um, uh, a graph of what our, our snowpack is looking like, but I can't bring it up, so I'll just talk about it. But um, as far as uh, a normal year goes, we're actually above average in terms of our cumulative snowfall. And that definitely shows in our coverage around the mountain. Um, we're just above average and reasonably more than we had last last season as well so we're looking pretty good out there nice uh like for the rest of the park marcus is that is that kind of play out for what you're seeing like to me it's quite thin in the alpine where it's been scoured but if we're down around tree lines like slightly deeper snowpack than usual right now yeah i think like what we've been seeing and talking about is how i feel like a lot of the alpine areas especially the very high alpine areas like around say wapta or some of the other ice fields there's a lot of bare ice I've been seeing on like high glaciers. Um, like a lot of the peaks on the Wapta have been reported to be very dry. Places you can normally ski or just rock um, or there's some ice showing. Um, and then you get down a tree line and it seems like, yeah, maybe those winds have like just blown all that snow and it's just now packed a tree line. It's a little warmer so, and so it's not fastening out, it's bonding well. And, sort of just building up in those like just below alpine areas and I mean even where we've been skiing uh, lately which again not a typical place in the massive range it's like the the lower forest by now would, would wouldn't have snow uh, generally it'd be mostly melted out but we're still skiing in and out you know moderately okay uh, mm -hmm. compared to most years so even below tree line may be a little easier to travel because of the warm temps less mm -hmm. faceting and then those tree line areas, yeah, seem to be deeper. And that, that might persist or might go on for a little while here because uh, a melt freeze crust or two down low is just going to help us with travel uh, until we start getting real melt. But uh, 
that'll come and then everyone will have to uh, <laughs> stay up high. Um, yeah, just, just I see in the chat there, we're calling on everyone for questions here. Definitely get your questions into the chat so I can ask Marcus and Zoe anything that's on your mind. Uh, but Zoe, just to bounce back to you, with the, the current snowpack out there right now, if I'm reading the public bulletin properly, we've got a couple fasted layers, sort of a meter down to 50 centimeters down, something like that, persistent weaknesses. Um, other than that, nothing too noteworthy that I'm seeing. Um, if that checks out with you, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but if that checks out with you, how do you think that will go forward as we turn into spring here? Yeah, so, I mean, earlier in the season, we were talking about quite a few persistent weak layers. Um, for the most part, we haven't seen very much reactivity except for on that, like, January, February layer, and then again on those basal weaknesses. Um, so moving forward, that's kind of going to be the two main things to have on your mind is the kind of mid snowpack, like you said, 50 to a meter down and then, and then on the ground, anything in between that doesn't seem to be showing any reactivity and is really healed throughout the season. Boring. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's good. That's good for us to have a boring snowpack. That's very un Rockies esque but, uh, we're happy for it. Um, so generally, th there's a term that we have for March, often like a transitional snowpack, we call it, especially in the Rockies where things are cold, days are short, the snowpack's used to being cold, all those layers are preserved. Then we, you know, as March goes, things warm up a bit, days are longer, it's warmer, longer, uh, some heat starts getting in the snowpack. And in some ways, things start to bond and get better in anticipate in spring, but there's just a, a transition phase in between. Um, I don't know, I've heard lots of old guides allude to the fact that uh, March is a good good month to take off if you're a ski guide because it's it's when most uh, bad avalanches happen. Um, I don't know, yeah, can you give us any insight into that or do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, so in my mind, there's kind of a few things that are happening there. The first one you said, um, so we've got this complex snowpack that is built up over the winter. Um, there's quite a few different weak layers in there. Um, it's still quite a dry snowpack. And then the next thing happening is that the sun's getting higher in the sky. Our days are longer. There's more solar radiation. It's quite a bit warmer. Mm -hmm. So it's seeing a substantial amount of heat in the snowpack. And then the last thing that's happening is that we're having these uh, longer windows of high pressure and people are getting after it and getting after big objectives and and I think the combination of those three things is what really makes March a dangerous month for us. So it's in some ways maybe a matter of just not jumping the gun too much, you know, not acting like it's true spring until it is. I mean, I guess spring is what, uh, on the 20th? Uh, but the snowpack doesn't know that date. So it's more, uh, you know, once the snow, snowpack goes through a few of these warm ups and, and adjust to it all. Yeah, like the big thing would be pay attention to these first few warm-ups. Um, they're really going to have an effect on the snowpack and, and watch what's happening, be quite careful. And then as we start to really get into spring um, and the snowpack is a little bit more used to the warm temperatures, I would say, um, that's when you can kind of start to step out and, and trust it a little bit more. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I guess just the classic thing the the snowpack never likes any big change. And so warming up is a change. New snow is a change, all these things. So yeah, all that. Um, cool. Any, any other thoughts as we head into spring here, like going forward for the rest of the season? I think that's about everything for me. Um, yeah, it looks like it's going to be a good spring. We've got really good coverage on the ground and hoping to get some sunny days out there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Awesome, Marcus. Well, that, that kind of sets us up to talk a little bit about you know, spring skiing and spring objectives. And, you know, we talked about how people often start the season up high and then this year they've moved down to 93 South and things like that. And now we're moving back up high, but in the Rockies, there's sort of that classic spring, which is the Wafta, the sort of high glaciated things, Hector, uh, all those kind of things. Um, yeah. What, what else would be sort of typical spring? Uh, well, before I get into that, I was just going to add, like, I always find it funny when people tell me, like spring is safer for skiing. And I think a lot of people mix predictability 
I, I, I think I always view spring as it's predictable. It gets really hot in the afternoon, be done early. You know, it's not that it's safer, it's just more predictable. So don't, I think that's an important differential uh, thing to differentiate uh, between uh, safety and predictability. Um, I just thought I would add that. No, that, that makes sense, yeah. And that, and that March though, that transition zone is actually less predictable. It's, it's uh, yeah. often some unpredictability. And then once we're into that sort of melt freeze cycle is it gets, it does get quite predictable, but. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, we're going to see in the next couple of days, it's going to get super, super hot. And I mean, that aspect of it is predictable. How that's going to react is the unpredictable. I think like, how, like, you know, as always saying is they're, they're not seeing what maybe they normally see. Um, and that's that transitional period that we just, don't have any clue what actually will hey, hey marcus oh yeah so i was just gonna say like uh actually zoe and i were supposed to set you up by talking about the weather that's coming our way <laughs> and we didn't oh. do it so uh, can you give us a little synopsis of because uh, because there's a significant weather change coming this weekend isn't there totally so um i think it's on sunday that it's forecast so sunday the freezing levels are gonna um rise significantly to around 2500 meters so um, rapid temperature change, like Kevin was saying, anything rapid uh, is generally not good for our snowpacks. So that's going to be a time to to watch what's around you and and see what's happening out there. Yeah, it could could be an interesting weekend that way. Um, so. Th thanks for that. Sorry, sorry, Marcus. Uh, 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 <laughs> yeah. So spring objectives. Well, I don't know. If is my map working for everyone? Yeah, I see a big picture there. Cool. Um, so yeah, obviously the one that people, you know, right around now start thinking about and start doing is the WAPTA. Uh, not the great greatest satellite imagery of the WAPTA on Google Earth, but you got Bow Lake here, uh, Pedo there, or Pedo. Um, the big difference is this year, with the WAPTA um, will be the huts. So, you know, I, I usually camp on the WAPTA. I don't usually stay at the huts. So you always see about a hundred people going every, every uh, different way while I'm camping in the middle and they're just going between each of the huts. Um, but because the huts are, I believe ACC is doing like full group uh, uh, buyouts. So, there might be maybe a little bit less traffic or maybe there'll be more camping traffic. Uh, but for people unfamiliar with that area, you got, yeah, Pato. So you have Pato Glacier, you go up, uh, uh, house up here, I think right there. Uh, and then you just sort of traverse across down to Balfour. Bowhut for people doing a shorter one is right here. And the big change this year is going to be like how people exit and how they're going to get back home. Uh, because as everyone is probably aware of by now, uh, the lodge here is usually where you finish and they have cut off their parking. What's that? So this is a great divide lodge you're talking about or West Louise. And that's where everyone used to park. And we've talked about it every snowpack summary so far that the parking there is now further down the highway, further west. And, uh, yeah. and it's minimal and you can't park there for a week. So, so yeah. a couple of options is to, you know, park in, uh, you could park in O'Hara and I guess walk down the, the road um, if you don't have that option. Uh, the other option would be to get parked maybe in Lake Louise uh, and then get a taxi. So you do get some spotty cell service at the trailhead so you can either try that or um you know if you have an in-reach device maybe just set it up so that you can in-reach your your buddy that's you know back at home uh, not skiing and just tell him to phone a taxi tell him to to come to the lodge or come to the trailhead uh, whatever you decided um, the other option for the wapta that people maybe should just do uh, to just avoid all that is the Bow Yoho. Uh, so you either start in uh, at Pato Lake or Bow and you go across 
and you come down into Lil Yoho and there's a few different ways to exit, but generally speaking, people take the Tack Falls Road all the way out. You can always jump over Yoho Pass here. And believe it or not, there has been a few people that have skied down between the presents. Uh, I've never done it, but I guess it goes. So you could <coughs> ski down all the way down to Emerald Lake, which would be a pretty wild way to finish that trip. Um, later in the season, hopefully my Google is working, uh, but if not, everyone probably knows the Columbia Ice Field. Uh, so that's not really a, a right now objective for most people, although you'll probably start seeing uh, some reports of people going up there uh, pretty soon. Uh, I was up there about a month and a half ago doing recon and all these lower areas were just bare ice. Um, the ramp looked like you could probably get up, you know, Basque there. Uh, and I'm sure even if the Saskatchewan was bare, you can get up there in, in pretty bad conditions. I've done that route lots of times. Um, but that's sort of like, uh, you'll start to see heavy traffic up into this area, like May, uh, even June is, is a more traditional um, time. I start seeing some stuff pretty soon. Yeah, it's always um, shocking how, uh, how bare Athabasca and Andromeda and everything look when you think yeah. it's spring, but it's, it's just not quite <laughs> there. It needs to be warm enough for the snow to stick up there on the, the steeper yeah. line. Eh? Yeah, exactly. Like you're talking about very big ice fields and hopefully my Google Earth things work in here. But not only do you have a huge um, Columbia ice field, you know, you have the Clemenceau over here and you have a whole bunch of ice fields um, all along the divide. And so that keeps it, you know, you're, you're always a month or two, depending on what's going on up there, sort of behind, like say the Bow Valley. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's still winter probably up there and the snow is just not sticking to those faces basically. And, and you're going to have a lot of crevasse problems because of that. Uh, there's probably been a high winds. So you could, you could see like a lot of bridge crevasses, but the, you don't know how thick they are because it could be just really dense wind slab. So it's, I would say it's, yeah, we're still a couple of months away from that. The more adventurous, we'll probably head up there pretty soon, <laughs> but it's definitely, uh, it would be a adventure season up there. I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And so, I mean, in my mind, I was thinking today as I looked across the Boba or to the Wapta, maybe this is a good year to try something else. You know, if it's Wapta is the classic spring thing, maybe go try a different. I like your idea of the Bo Yoho that with the parking and stuff that that makes sense. Can you think of any other? You know, if someone's into traverses, something else would yeah. be sort of a, a good five day mission. Yeah, if you're into traverses and a little bit of suffering, uh, <laughs> there's some good ones, uh, Drummond and uh, uh, Bonnet. Um, so you go up, that's in the Chick Scott book. Uh, I believe he has you going up, um, I hope my map's working, but basically going up Mosquito Creek, going over uh, Moeller to Fish Lakes, and then you get on to the North um, Glaciers here of Drummond and Cataract. And um, you get up on here and you ski down and you're sort of back behind Skokie, which is just down to the uh, Southwest. And then you go up onto these ice fields. And basically there's a bunch of glaciers uh, just behind, it's on the Northern Sawbax. And you sort of traverse, takes a couple of days. And then you come down uh, and you end up in Johnson Canyon. So the big problem with that one this year is the Highway 1A is closed. So there are, there's a really cool traverse that was done quite often in the 80s that most people don't know about. Um, and again, I hope my map's working, but uh, Luella and just Lake. a little behind you, but it, it gets there. It's just a little behind yeah. you. Cool. So you come off uh, the glaciers and you, I've skied this valley lots of times. It's really not fun, <laughs> um, but you can cut off halfway to go up to Llewellyn Lake and you can actually get on to Castle this way. Um, and oh, yeah. there is a little bit of a steep 
cool our feature here, but uh, you sort of just make your way up and then you get on this really cool high line um, and you're just in the high alpine and you can ski down from Castle down to Rockbound Lake. And then worst case scenario there, uh, if you get to the Rockbound Lake Trail, uh, it's a summer trail, it's, it's nice and wide. Uh, so even if it's melted out or not perfect, it, at least you got something nice to walk down. Uh, it's a lot better than if uh, this 30 kilometers turns into 30 <laughs> or 40 because of the closed 1A. Um, yeah. This is a very long valley. Um, and then you can always highlight, highline uh, the, the, this area um, of Castle, going up Rockbound Lake. These used to be pretty popular in the 80s. There's a bunch of stuff in the ACC journals uh, where a couple of guys were just going every which way. So uh, you can go on the ACC journals online uh, for free and you can look those up. Just look up Castle Mountain, uh, you'll, you'll find them. That's something pretty different. Um, Cool. I mean, the other ones, what else is popular? I mean, going way north, um, a lot of people right around now, once the closure is done, do the eight pass route. So from Jasper to, there's that warden cabin I'm forgetting the name of, uh, but basically you, you traverse this whole upper area. Uh, and there's a couple different um, routes you can do. There's the five pass route. And there's the eight pass route. Uh, basically, you start in Jasper, you end up down, you know, 100 kilometers south. Um, so you need two cars, you need to figure that kind of stuff out. There's no cell reception where you finish. So it's not like you get someone to pick you up unless you have an in reach. Uh, and those are really fun. You know, you're, you go up a pass, you, you ski down, you go up another pass, you ski down. So there, it's, you know, pretty flowy. Uh, there's no huts. I don't think anyways. Um, so you need to, you know, bring a tent or a tarp. Uh, those ones you can find in the Chick Scott books, uh, but you do need to wait until those areas are open because they do have uh, closures for caribou. Uh, I don't know when exactly those open this year. They've sort of changed each year. So it might already be open, but just check with Jasper uh, National Park if you plan to head up there. Those are, yeah, those are some awesome ideas, actually. I didn't think of those, so thanks. And thanks for the beta on how to research them. Um, sweet. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's it, Abe, eh, Marcus. Anything else we want to talk about for, for spring and looking ahead, or do we that cover it? Um, I mean, the main advice for me is, like, uh, I always say, you know, in the spring, get high, stay high. I really like camping, so you figure out what the freezing level is and sort of plan your trip around that. And, and that's like a big thing in April for me. It's like, where's the freezing level? Where do I not have to suffer? And always plan a, a little extra day. Like if you're, if you want to do two days of skiing, I would attack on another extra day. So if you're thinking a three day trip, say take a four day trip and leave really early on that fourth day, like just sleep, let it freeze and then ski out through the valley when it's frozen. Um, instead of like saying, well, I need to, I need to work tomorrow morning. Well, just get up at four and ski the frozen stuff back to your car and, and go straight to work, I guess. I don't know. Right. That's instead of being, instead of feeling like the pressure to get home at four in the afternoon when everything's warm and avalanche yeah. winds are spiking. Exactly. Yeah. Just go to bed early and get up and yeah, have work clothes in the truck, I guess. <laughs> I like that. that. That's awesome advice. Sweet, Marcus, thanks. Um, we have some questions in the thing for both of you guys, but I think we're gonna do questions after we uh, after we finish our little circle here by talking to Joelle at the shop. Joelle from the bench, how hey, you doing? Okay. You, you, you've had some action the last little while. Congratulations on the dolphin there. Yeah, we had a couple of good, uh, good, uh, good, good turns were had, but. Uh, yeah, it's the time of the year where you walk to stuff and you turn around sometimes too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, take your yeah. gear for a walk at three in the morning. And then... Yeah, no, exactly. It's the time where like, usually I, it's always funny, like I don't really drink much Red Bull, but like in the spring, I do have a crate of it uh, like that that's waiting for me. Uh, but no, it, it's it's been funny. We've, we've heard that like 
uh, you know, here at the, at the shop, at the shop, like the, the staff's been kind of getting out last week when it was like really warm and, and, you know, everything was super wet and didn't really get much success along the, along the kind of like Banff to Lake Louise highway. But then like, we got really good reports all weekend and all week this week of like some really good skiing up high, like in the shade, um, you know, chicka boom, like the whole kind of kindergarten boom area is skiing good. The oh, park has been skiing great, Bow Summit even. Uh, north of Pegado, um, if you look at like Patterson and Mini Golf there, Kefren, like everything that's kind of like more in the shade, a bit more protected shelter, it's been skiing good. And we've also had some kind of funny, eh, uh, kind of weird convective sort of little kind of mini storms. Eh? The parkway, what yesterday morning was like full on like winter storm, minus 15, 50K an hour wind, like horizontal snow for for a few hours. And then it was like sunny in Lake Louise. Um, so yeah, that was a. Uh, it was, it's that time of the year, I guess. Yeah, totally. Um, we were going to ask you uh, for some tips. Like, well, actually, first I want to ask you about this ball that's behind you. It looks like uh, some cat has been playing with like a toy back there. What is that yeah, thing? our cat's name is Chris. He's our weekend tech. Um, <laughs> and he's been actually collecting. That's just the trimmings of all the skins we've been cutting this year and only him. Like, I don't <laughs> add anything to the ball. And it's probably about like... We had to reinforce the attachment because it's falling. So like, <laughs> I'd say it's probably like almost 10 kilos now. All right. You've worked on a lot of skins, I guess. A lot of skins. But yeah, it's uh, <laughs> that's, that's the our tech skin ball. Um, but yeah, I think gear for spring. Um, the first thing I, I think that, uh, and I, even myself, I'm, I'm guilty of that, is like, you know, it's, it's time in March to do a little bit of a, an overhaul of like what you have and what's broken and what's failing. Um, you know, I myself get surprised every year with like, ah, oh, I didn't think about this. Like, I didn't look at that. I wanted to get this done. Um, you know, classic examples like, um, you know, you were saying the dolphin. So like, I ended up grabbing a ski that I didn't really want to ski on because it was my sharpest ski, and I didn't know what conditions we're gonna have. And like, my good ski that I really like right now was not very sharp, so I didn't grab it. So that's like, those are all like things that in the spring with varying snow conditions, it's it gets increasingly important to have like a well-maintained ski with like, you know, a wax base and sharp edges and uh, all that. Right. So definitely like have a look at your gear look what's like in maybe not such a good shape. And it's a good time before that transition to more spring conditions to kind of make sure everything is in good working order, the boots and everything. I was definitely wishing I had uh, better wax skis last week when I was out and it, the first couple of days it got warm, you know, those things were getting sticky and I was like, Oh yeah, I need to, uh, need to get my skis reground and, and waxed for sure yeah. oh, and cool. like wax your skins like right yeah so i was gonna ask you about this i think a lot of people probably haven't even thought of that so uh yeah why do we wax our skins and and uh, how do we do it so waxing your skins is basically a way to increase the water repellency and make sure this, that the water doesn't get into the fibers so what happens that it's say, you know, I did that last week, so I didn't wax my skins. And then we went to Taylor Lake on Friday. It wasn't very good, but um, the skin, you start at like my plus three, plus four degrees, right? It was pretty wet. The snow was really, really soaked at the top layer. And then you get all that water in your skins. And at some point you hit like zero degrees in fresh snow. And then what happens is that all that snow starts freezing the water in the plush. And then you just end up having like, you know, a ton of snow under your skins. So a lot of people are going to carry like a little stick of whatever you have, you know, black diamond Pomoka makes some of that kind of little, you know, the little kind of stick. Yeah. We call it glob stopper usually. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah. You know, I always tell people like, if you have any temperature, like, you know, any uh, hot glide wax, it's exactly the same thing. It's nothing super special for skin. I mean, it's like very classic glide wax. So you know, at least carrying a little stick of it. But the best way to make sure that it doesn't happen is just to wax them at home before you leave, right? So there's like products like sprays you can use, like paste that you can apply directly at home that are going to last a few outings as well. Like typically in the spring, I'm going to do mine like once a week or once every two weeks, depending on how much I ski. Um, so but does the spray lasts more than, more than one? Yeah. If you just spray on it on, right, it's going to stay on the outside of the fibers, but it doesn't actually impregnate very deeply as opposed to like the Nick wax or, you know, the Pomoka products or whatever other kind of products you can have. My favorite trick is just to just basically grab like a stick of CH, a stick of warm, and then you can just crayon it directly on your, your skin at home. So put it on your ski 
uh, you just cray on it tip to tail, not tail to tip. You don't want to like, you know, trash the hair. And then I just grab the, uh, my waxing iron and I put it like a lowest setting. So about 80, 90 degrees. And then I just run it along directly on the plush uh, on the ski pretty quick, just to melt that little bit of wax that I've crayoned on. And then that really gets into the, the fibers. And then that way you actually get a pretty durable um, kind of, you know, waterproofing treatment. Um, that's like the way that ski mo racers do. Um, so yeah, super, super important to wax your skins. It sucks to have to turn around because your skins are balling. Yeah, totally. And, and a good time of year to carry a little scraper, uh, any kind of scraper, just cause you're often getting nice on your top sheet on the bottom and your binding. So having a scraper in your pocket helps a lot. Uh, Hey, do you guys sell sunscreen in like the little tube, like the little, uh, looks like a little deodorant tube, you know, that you screw oh, no, up. Yeah. No, like okay. a super, super strong one. <laughs> well, yeah, just like the redhead over here. I, yeah, I, need yeah, the ginger stick, special. I just pull it out of my pocket all, all, all uh, spring, but no, we don't sell that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they, 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 no, but that's an example. I, I think it's time in the spring to like re examine like what you carry and add a couple of things. Um, uh, like you said, a scraper, a little bit of, of wax, um, you know, um, blister pads. Like, if you don't carry those, like, we have a dramatic increase of like boot issues in the spring just because sweat, warmer weather, feet are a bit more swollen, kind of like there's more circulation. So like think about that stuff and it's time to definitely integrate that to like the, the first aid slash repair kit. Uh, same way as like what we tell with people who have like, if you have a bigger binding, like a, you know, a Fritchie or a Dinafit with like a bunch of parts, a bit of silicone spray goes a long way uh, to avoid like snow clogging and balling everywhere on the heels. So like, I haven't kind of heard like, that before. Just spray, yeah. spray all the working parts you buy under the silicone spray. To Just like a, a little bit under the heel, like sometimes we're around the brake assembly where it tends to get a bit of like snow stick there, like a bit of silicone spray on the, the brake parts or on the parts that you know are like tend to really accumulate a lot of, a lot of ice. Um, that's awesome. that's a, another good little kind of little trick. So yeah, time to kind of re-examine that and add those little couple little items to your, your repair kit. And yeah, make sure that the gear is fresh and in good condition um for us like we went from like no ski crampons to like 10 pairs a day <laughs> uh, in about a week right we so, used yeah, them today well, today was my I, first day the using, them, we used them in place. yeah the ski crampons the boot crampons uh you know make sure you have all the gear that that you need so that you're not like scrambling and calling around at midnight the day before because you're missing a pair of something that you need the next day right so yeah yeah that's awesome. Those are like some, some really good tips. Thanks, man. Uh, anything else from the shop you want to add in? I'm going to next go to the questions for Marcus and Zoe and, and see if they have any uh, special spring things they throw in their backpack. But before we do that, anything else from the shop? Uh, no, you know, we still have a lot of, uh, lots of uh, mountaineering skis available. If you ever want to demo stuff, you want to like, you know, I know there's like a bunch of Wapta in the day being done right now. So if you need to grab a ski mo ski, because you want to like, you know, not waste your time and just do it like quickly we have a bunch of demos of those too they're like 15 bucks a day uh we have a lot of cool skis mounted this year so if you're looking at something a bit narrower that you want to try on we have a bunch of like 85s 88s 90s uh that are like for april may kind of skiing that we still do let people demo and rent late in the season um the wall is down so we're expanding oh. finally the wall is down wait we're doing rentals right now so it's nice. like it's chaos but it's coming along um so yeah we get up in the morning ski uh, leave at four to go skiing come back at two then we work the shop till like late at night but uh no it's all, everybody's super stoked the staff is skiing a bunch of fun stuff and i think everybody's skiing a bunch of fun stuff right now it's the the most exciting time of the year usually that's starting yeah spring's the best time in the rockies for sure yeah all right thanks bud um yeah so just uh we've we've got some questions here gang but uh, the question I also wanted to ask you when, when we get to you both was if there's anything you throw in your pack for, for spring that you don't usually carry. But uh, Marcus, one question that came in for you was just, just about different camping spots on the WAPTA. I mean, uh, I've camped up there before, but it's just always wherever we're, whatever we're trying to ski, we just camp near. But are there any spots that are better than other spots? I mean, I don't you know if there's... More than 100 yeah. meters from the hut, I guess. Yeah, so that's that's one thing you got definitely um, we should talk about real quick is there is I don't know if it's 100 meters or if they've, it's actually further now I think oh. it might be a kilometer now um, that's something you'll have to check with the ACC but basically when you're camping up there 
Uh, first thing you need to get a baby permit um, to stay legal with parks, because if you do have to get rescued and you don't got one, there might be some questions asked. Um, and then along with that, you'll get the information about how close or how far away you have to be from an ACC hut. Um, it's also important to note that the ACC hut washrooms are for ACC hut renters. Um, I talked to the ACC about this a few times when I was writing a book. Um, and, you know, if you're going up there on an ice field, I'm sure a lot of people don't, but it's very easy to carry a wag bag. Um, so if you don't know what a wag bag is, it's basically a garbage bag that you take a dump in and then you wipe and you throw it in another bag and you seal that bag and then you put it in your sleeping bag to keep you warm at night. Uh, <laughs> but, and then at the end of the trip, you just throw it all out. Um, or you just eat a lot of cheese and you don't need them. But um, yeah, for as, as far as water spots outside the, the legal requirements, um, I, I do basically what you said, Kevin. It's like, if I'm doing a, if I'm doing a traverse, I'm just gonna like camp when I'm done. Or if a storm comes in and I don't feel like doing way out navigation, well, now I'm camping. Um, so for me, camping, I like camping rather than huts because it gives me freedom to move in the mountains that aren't being dictated by a hut. So if I want to go up Gordon, like I've slept at the summit of Gordon and then skied down the next morning. And that's because that's where I ended up when, the, when it got dark. And that's at, at super fun and super easy and you get your maximum time and you get a lot more skiing in because you don't have to return to the hut. You just carry your gear, you ski what you want and you set up your tent where you want. You know, I think the question was asking about uh, shelter from the weather. I mean, you're on a, a decent sized ice field. Uh, <laughs> I, like I, I prefer digging a hole and just, if it's not deep enough to dig a proper snow cave, I'll just bring a tarp and I just do a trench. And to be quite honest, it's, it's crazy the difference. Like I was, I was sleeping up on the um, Cathedral South Glacier a couple of years ago and there was super cold winds coming off the glacier. And I just had this little one meter by two meter tarp. I just made like, I just slept under a little thing and the wind was just shooting up and over. And when I stood up to go to the washroom, it was freezing cold. And the minute I got under that tarp, the wind just blew up and over it. So there's a lot of ways you can do it. Just see where the, the wind's going, which way it's going and just set up your tarp or your tent. And then you can also make, um, you know, if you dig out snow, you can create wind blockers, uh, which you want to do if there's a lot of snow anyways, because then you create a micro lee and that snow is deposited under that instead of being deposited on your tent. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I don't know if there's a magical spot on the Wapta to miss weather, but you know, just work in your small little area and, and set up a really good camp and you, you won't probably have as many problems as you think. Yeah, I would just throw in, if anyone's looking for uh, fun ski mountaineering, uh, Mount Aisha is something that gets overlooked. It's this like pretty gnar, but you don't have to go to the summit. Like it's a pretty cool zone. And because the huts are, are not along it, no one does it. So that's one spot you could go check out with a tent that you wouldn't normally. Yeah, and that's outside the park actually, so. Oh. I mean, you don't actually, there's a small section, if you look on the map, just just before you get to the mountain, that's where the border is. So if, if you put your tent on the other side of the border, you don't need a don't need permit. baby permit, I guess. You could just fly a helicopter right there then. Well. <laughs> All right, well, hey, is there anything you throw in your, in your pack for spring that you don't usually carry or? I think you guys mentioned most of the stuff, to be honest, like scraper, I actually carry year round. Yeah. Uh, but that's like a big one. Uh, ski crampons, I personally carry year round, but I probably use them mostly in the spring. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, if you're doing steep stuff, even if it's not like super steep, if you're going up self faces, you know, boot crampons and ice axe, uh, something that you would normally not think of having, say on like, you know, a 30 degree or 35 degree slope, you know, sometimes these are just a boot pack up stuff like that when it's like rock hard especially if you're leaving in the early morning and you're trying to summit something that's on a self face, just throw on those crampons, have the ice axe and just go straight up the thing instead of dealing with crampons and sliding around on skins and all that. Yeah. That makes sense with how light those are now, like the lightest crampons and, and like 
little ski mountaineering axe is so light like you might as well just throw it in every day it used to be you were getting it out of your pack because it was heavy but now you don't yeah. need to uh hey mike ch chimed in here just saying he talked to parks this week and that it's one kilometer from the huts on the wafta you're you're right marcus stay a kilometer go. away from the huts where you're camping uh zoe how about you there was one question here for you if i just scroll back uh so yeah question from fraser here oh he had to take off but anyhow his question is a good one uh for the transitional period in march or whenever that is uh will the forecast typically represent oh this is more like the spring avalanche forecast will it typically represent the highest danger rating of the day or uh the a general rating for the day you talked about the diurnal swings which just means like the the twice daily swings so like the cold to hot low to high avalanche danger uh, so, so what's the forecast uh, talking about there? Yeah, so that's a that's a really good question. Um, in March, my answer is it depends. Depends on what they're talking about, right? So, if they're talking about um, high freezing levels, generally that's going to be in the afternoon, and it's going to be for later in the day. But like we were talking about earlier, in Lake Louise, you can see these um, convective flurries that bring. Um, large amounts of precipitation to localized areas. You guys hear me there? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Um, so it might be for, you know, our, our more typical midwinter problems like our wind slab or, or a storm slab hazard, loose dry. So it really depends on what they're talking about in the bulletin at this time of year. Um, and it's going to be more so geared to the afternoon if it's talking about a temperature influence. Right, so if it is like, let's say even late May when it's it's clearly a melt free cycle, low, low avalanche danger in the morning and then high avalanche danger in the afternoon, they'll usually rate it as high, right? Yeah, I think they have uh, a special spring rating oh, yeah. where it's the high, low, it's like right. the, the green slash red. And that's when they're talking about um, those temperature changes throughout the day. Mm -hmm. but, um, I think at this time of year, they'll, they'll mention it if it's going to be later in the day, more so in that like little word blurbage at the beginning of the forecast. Yeah, right. Yeah, totally that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it depends. That, that's always the, yes, the yeah. avalanche educators answer to every question. Nice work. <laughs> um, one, one other one then, just uh, you mentioned convective a couple times, and I think Joelle mentioned it too, that... Um, there's these storms that happen in the spring where uh, little areas like today or yesterday, I think Lake Louise ski area itself got a lot of snow, uh, but up at Bow Summit, they only got, instead of 10 centimeters, they got maybe two or something. That's because that's a convective storm. Um, what does that mean? We've said convective a few times tonight, but just so everyone knows, what does convective mean? Um, so convective storms are like these localized storms caused by the like warmer air masses, uh, essentially. And um, they're pretty short lived generally, but um, relatively high intensity. So in the springtime, you'll notice that, you know, you drive from Lake Louise to Banff and you'll go through an area where it's absolutely dumping and then you get to Banff and it's blue skies. And that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about those convective flurries. Yeah, so we had one actually in Banff just yesterday or the day before, I can't remember. And yeah, just all of a sudden it's hammering snow, like harder than it ever snows. And an hour later it's gone. But you know, it's dropped four centimeters in that hour or something. And, and so uh, it means like the rising, right? The you, you said the warm air mass. And so that warm air rises and then uh, precipitates. Exactly, yeah. Is there, uh, I think that's it for questions there for you, but I was going to ask if there was anything you throw in your pack in spring or anything you change about your program in spring? You know, nothing that hasn't been mentioned. I think you guys nailed it. Um with everything you've said on the spring, yeah. Nice, uh, other than maybe we all just wake up a little earlier and leave a little earlier, I guess, in spring, but I'm just scanning the questions here as we do it, but I think that's it. Dave, did you have any, were there any more uh, questions that came in your way? I just sent you another one that someone sent. Kevin. Oh yeah. It's at the bottom. Is it a good idea to be planning most, oh yeah. Um, is it a good idea to be planning mostly north facing skiing this time of year uh i think there's a few ways we could go with that team but uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah great uh, marcus where are we gonna find the best skiing right now 
I mean, lately it seems to be in those shaded areas um, because of those kind of random, you know, spikes in, in temperature and the hot sun and stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of, even on the little micro solar stuff, there's these like crust forming. Um, like when I skied the, that east face of the unnamed, you know, the, the main run I skied was like perfect snow. But the minute I got in something that was like even just slightly more east, there was just this hint of crust. And then the more I would just go on something a little bit more, now there's a firmer crust. Uh, when we skied uh, Pilot there, um, you know, on the, on the shaded, you have basically a row of trees. And right there was perfect, beautiful snow. Uh, and then on the left side where the sun's hitting, it's like a crust that you can almost ski on. It's almost like corn is starting to form. So you're going to get these, you know, completely different things, even in micro, in a single run, there could be micro little areas of different snow. So generally right now, those shaded areas and colder areas are better. Uh, of course, that will change. Um, and, you know, you'll start getting like temperature crusts and stuff just from just the raw temperature, even in the north aspects, where you'll start getting crusts and weird kind of slabs. Um, but then eventually the cell faces will get really nice and corned up and that'll be fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing uh, Nicholas maybe meant a little, like I, I said ski quality because that's what I was thinking. But yeah. I'm guessing he probably meant a little bit more about like avalanche hazard too. Zoe, yeah. like right now, the only, it's changed tonight, but when as of this morning when it was three times low, the only avalanche problem they had was on the north. So when he says it's a good idea, maybe to plan mostly north skiing, how's that, I don't know, how's that work from an avalanche perspective? Yeah, so um, for sure the ski quality at the moment is probably going to be better on the north aspects. Um, a lot of our solar aspects have a nasty crust. It's pretty breakable in some places. Um, but because there isn't that crust present on the north aspects, um, we still have that persistent weak layer to worry about. Um, just because there isn't the cross that can sometimes bridge the layers that are below it. So when you have a, a melt freeze crust over the surface of the snowpack, um, it can kind of help to stabilize in the short term, the snowpack underneath of it. But um, we don't have that on the north aspects right now. And um, that's making it more dangerous, essentially. Yeah, really how we talk about the uh those persistent weaknesses lasting longer in the Rockies because it's a cold climate, dry climate. The snowpack doesn't heal as quickly. The north aspects just exasperate that a bit. Hey, like the south aspects right now are getting warmth and, and suddenly the north is going to preserve those problems longer uh, and be better skiing. Classic. Goes hand in hand, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but you mentioned uh, this idea of, of uh, a crust sort of forming and almost capping the snowpack and, and just like freezing it in place. There's gonna be times, where I feel like we're still a month away from it here, but going into April when it's true spring and melt freeze cycles are happening, there'll be a time when, when the snowpack is just frozen in place and in the morning it's totally safe. Um, I, th I think everyone understands that we've gotten that, but what, what does that mean for corn skiing? Like what's that magic uh, period you're trying to finesse then? Elusa corn skiing. Yeah. Yes, what we're talking about there is um, the perfect corn skiing conditions are when, you know, the top portion of the snowpack has started to melt and you've got these nice loose um, melt forms that you can ski on, uh, but you still have a supportive base underneath. So when the snowpack goes isothermal, so the whole snowpack is at zero degrees, um, it's lost all cohesion and you're just breaking through and it's terrible skiing that's when it gets really dangerous, but we're looking for that sweet spot in between um, jaw rattling, melt freeze and breaking through to your waist. And that's when you get the good skiing in the spring. Yeah, totally, really well described, that was awesome. Uh, but yeah, if we, if we picture like the top, say 20 centimeters freezing into a crust uh, and then you know the rest of the snowpack's below, but that top 20 centimeters is an ice crust, and then the top 10 starts to melt again. We still have 10 centimeters of, of melt freeze crust for safety. We have that 10 centimeters of nice loose snow. That's oh. the corn snow that everyone's 
Talk and it's a tough window to, to get. It's, it's hard to predict exactly when during the day you're going to get it. Sometimes you got to wait. Sometimes you get there too late. Yeah. And you're often sitting on the peak waiting for it to get soft enough while the valley bottom has gone too soft. And they only get yeah. half the run is good. Yeah. Um, sweet. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I think, I think we're pretty much there guys. Um, Joelle, Dave, anything else we should be adding here or Marcus, Zoe, anything else? Or are we kind of hitting the end here? Nothing, uh, nothing for me, Kevin. I think we covered everything for tonight. Joel, how you doing? Good. Yeah. No, I think uh, you know that's a lot of good, uh, good beta. I think it was gonna be a. It's been an exciting week already this week. So hopefully everybody, like lots of people, are getting some really good skiing. So it's awesome. But I think it's the time of the year where you know starting to plan a bit more is getting really important. And uh, you know with start times and following the weather a bit more maybe as well. Um, and yeah, like getting your gear set up. Like I've every every year I hear stories of people setting up their boot crampons at the bottom of the line. Uh, not the best place for that stuff so yeah you know plan ahead be prepared and then i you know it's always better to leave a bit too early than a bit too late yeah 